Now we see the birth of the younger twin, the left-handed younger twin. This is their mother. And you can see over her left shoulder is her waist strap and then the back fringe. And we'll see that on other females, including the younger twin. The elder firstborn larger twin is sort of hypermasculine, whereas the younger twin is, is feminine in some respects. Uh, he's shown in feminine clothing, as we'll see. And he, he becomes the moon because in most of the stories about the moon in the Americas, the moon is considered female and the, the sun is considered male. So here, here is the birth. This is a birthing scene. She's not only in a birthing posture, but this is a birthing scene showing the birth of the younger left-handed feminine twin. Here now is the grandmother that I just spoke about. And you can see that she, she's wearing, here's the band across here, and then here's her back fringe down here. She has female breasts. She's old, she's using a walking stick, right? And on her back is an outsized burden basket. And that is a perfect metaphor for her burden, which is in the absence of the mother who disappears from the tale, to literally and figuratively raise the twins. And you, see, you can see the artist in this case went to great pains to show you that this is the larger right-handed, there's his left arm, right-handed twin holding a sunflower because he will become the sun. And then here, the left-handed, smaller feminine twin, and I don't mean female, I mean feminine here, is holding a, what I've described as a moon flower. Right? So here we begin to see the, the use of, of symbols or elements in a motif such as this to represent a metaphor, the raising of the twins. Right? And the whole story, whether it's in the Maya version or on Maya pottery, uh, specifically classic Maya pottery, there are elements. Uh, the classic Maya pottery was made between about AD 200 and 900. And then also elements are shown in some of the uh, codices, specifically in the um, post-classic Madrid Codex. Now, this is like a portrait of the twins. Here again, on the right, we see the elder twin. And then on the left, we see the younger twin. I don't know exactly what this netting is, but we saw it on the father as well. So it seems to be whatever it is associated with males rather than, rather than females. The right-handed twin is wearing a male sash, white and tied in front. The younger feminine twin is wearing a dress or kind of a shift, a necklace. And then here's her waistband and then the back fringe hanging down below, right? The other thing that's important to, to notice here, and this is almost like a reiteration, the right-handed twin's right arm is larger and the left, the left-handed twin's left arm is smaller than his. So his right arm is larger than his left arm and her or his left arm, oops, <laughs> Let me see if I can go back to that. Oops. Sorry. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> I lost my train of thought there for a minute. So again, we're beginning to see this, this distinction between the twins. It's interesting to note um, that we're dealing here with this left arm. We're dealing with what's referred to as sinistrality. That is left-handedness. In the Americas, and perhaps elsewhere, the left hand or the left side has to do with death and with women. This is a, this is a key part of one of the dualities that, that is just emblematic of everything in this, in this story. Dualities are not common to Western civilizations, but they're very, very common in uh, Asia, for instance, the idea of the yin-yang, 
also referred to as the fish. And we'll see images that are very similar to that in members as well. So we've got one of the dualities that's going on right here is that this right-handed twin, ma the masculine twin, right, is, is right-handed. Only about 10% of the world population is left-handed. So uh, this is intentional. I also found in, in uh, some of my studies when I was looking at Maya uh, representations on uh, cylindrical vessels, that many of the decapitation and other violent, violent scenes, but especially those with the use of a hatchet or ba'at, were held in the left hand. Sometimes the right hand would have a left, right arm would have a left hand on it. So again, this, this is part of this idea of association of the left hand with death. Now here we have a confrontation with one of the monsters. In the Popo Vu, the monster is the first monster is referred to as seven macaw. This is a gloss for the words vukub seven kakish, which is red feathers. So this is his name, but he's not necessarily a bird, as we'll see. We'll look at some Maya images as well. He is, however, a monster, a giant monster. In the Popo Vu version, Kunapu, or hunter, shoots this monster with a blowgun. He wounds him in the jaw. And here you can see a confrontation that's taking place between the elder twin, the right-handed twin, and this monster here, right? Now keep in mind, we'll see other versions of this monster, but they're not all painted by the same hand. So there are going to be differences, other types of animals, etc. And I should point out that seven macaw isn't necessarily a bird. It can be represented as a bird, but it isn't a macaw itself. It's simply the name of this monster. Uh, the younger twin, I already said that the older twin is Hunapu, which is one hunter or one blow gunner. And the younger twin has, has a sort of a complicated name. It's Shpalanke, which is various, variously translated as little jaguar son, jaguar deer, but it's definitely a feminine name. It's not that he's a woman, but he has feminine aspects. So here we see the confrontation between the elder twin and what I think here is a representation of blood because the monster's been wounded in the jaw. And here are his teeth right here. And that's another problem with, with the name Seven Macaw. And we'll get to that in a minute. But you can see the monster is grasping his left arm. And in the Popo Vu, and in this particular image, the monster tears the arm, the left arm, off of the right-handed twin. So that's what's, that's what's happening here. Now we see the image of a Bruin bear-like figure and a very clearly a, le a left, well, at least a human arm, right? And his teeth, once again. So this animal, this monster can be represented with, with different imagery, right? It's not strictly a bird, although we'll see another image shortly that looks somewhat like a bird, right? But it's, it's more of a monster or a giant. So here, here's this monster with the arm of the elder twin. Now in this one, this one's been, this has been reconstructed. Um, you can see the younger twin with both of his arms on the back of what some people have called an owl, but it's an owl with a really odd tail, if it's an owl at all. But again, it's mostly a monster and a giant. And here again is the arm of the twin. So in this story, but it's, it's a little different in the Popo Vu. In, in the Mimbris version, it seems to be the younger twin who gets the arm back. And he does this by blinding the monster and pulling his teeth. Now the teeth would be a problem 
if in fact the monster is a bird or a macaw of any kind, because they don't have teeth, as we know, right? But here, here is one of a number of scenes that show the younger twin in the process of blinding and, re and removing the teeth that have been damaged by the blowgun pellet, right? And in the Popo Vu, it's a little bit different. It, the twins actually entice some grandparent-like figures who uh, claim that they fix broken teeth and they pull the teeth of the monster and replace them with corn kernels. Now, this monster has two sons and at least one of them is illustrated in the Mimbres uh, bowls. This one claimed to be a mover of mountains. And that's what you have here, a figure who's literally lifting up a mountain range. An attempt was made to kill this monster by some other individuals. They're called the 400 boys in the Popo Vu version. And they, they dug a deep hole and they enticed this monster into the hole and they plan to drop a big log down on top of him. And here is this big monster, the one we saw before, right? In a similar position, filling this hole. But what he does is he digs a side tunnel. So he escapes being murdered, right? And what the twins do is they entice this same monster with his favorite food, some sort of crabs, into a canyon and then they bring down a mountain upon him. He's trapped and then he's killed. Now here's, here's another monster that the, the twins have to deal with. Um, this is, <laughs> I refer to this one as the bird of doom. You can see the human decapitated head over on the right, the extraordinarily long neck this is not a real bird. <laughs> and we'll, we'll see some Maya versions of this as well. But it's, a, it's an underworld bird and it consumes souls of the dead represented by fish. So the hero twins are confronted by this one. It's represented in Maya iconography as well, but it's not particularly well understood. We'll get to that shortly. So what they do with respect to this guy is they, oops, How do I, oh, there we go. They do a little performance for him. We can see the right-handed larger twin on the left and the younger, smaller twin on the right. They're doing a dance performance, again, on this exaggerated neck of this bird of doom and Basically, they convince him to <laughs> stop eating the souls of the dead and to, to only eat fish on, in the middle world. A good analogy for one of these, but it, it's not really species specific, but if you think about a cormorant, a cormorant can fly in the air, so if that's the upper world. It can walk on the surface of the middle world and it can dive up to 80 feet below the surface, in this case, of the watery underworld to feed on fish. More of that later. So here they're successful again in, in dealing with these monsters uh, who, who are inhabiting the earth before people are created. Now, once the twins have grown and they've had some adventures on Earth, they discover the ball game equipment that their father and uncle, uncle were using. And that's what called the father and uncle to be uh, requested in the watery underworld, right? And this is the test. This is one of six different houses. This is as far as the father and uncle got. Right. This is the test where the twins, in this case, the larger twin on the right, left-handed twin on the left, they're given smoking tubes, right? And 
You can see in one hand, they're holding what I think is a flake to make a spark, but they've attached feathers to, to the smoking tube to make it appear as if they're smoking. This allows them in the morning to exit the dark house with the, the smoking tube still full of tobacco, but unsmoked, right? So this is their first defeat of the Lords of Death. They do this through trickery. Then they're challenged to their first, first ball game. And in my reading of this, this is the larger twin down here. This is the younger twin. And this is one of the death chiefs. He's putting in, he's trying to put into play a rubber ball, right, with a knife in it, right, which would be an implement of death. But they, they want to use their own balls. You can see that they're wearing a different type of sash, which is probably a form of, of padding common to the ball game, and they're all wearing some kind of horns. Um, it's difficult to say exactly what they might, what kind of horns they might be. The point is they're wearing headgear, uh, perhaps bison horns, but uh, that's very speculative. The point is they're wearing ball, ball game gear. They're wearing these padded um, hip pieces as well as headgear. None of the ball games is successful one way or the other. They're, they're, they play to a draw. So what happens is they go to these, these six different houses at night and then they, they play the ball game during the day. So other, other houses include one of, of uh, sharp knives. They're not cut up by the knives. There's, there's another with jaguars. They're not eaten by the jaguars. Again, they're using trickery, right? There, there's also the bat house. Here's a big, scary <laughs> membrane bat. And these are very similar to bats depicted on uh, Maya pottery, often with um, crossbones and, and death signs on the wings. Um, and this is actually uh, based on a, a type of um, vampire bat. Uh, in the, in the uh, Popo Vu, they're described as komozats, that is killer bats, right? In the Popo Vu, while they're in the bat house, the twins crawl inside their blowguns, right? They're able to do this because they're, they're tricksters. Also, they're, they're interesting because half of their lineage is from the underworld, the other half is from the middle world, right? So they have advantages um, on both sides of, of their families. So what happens is the elder, more aggressive twin becomes slightly impatient in, in the bat house and he sticks his head out of the blowgun and this big huge bat comes along and simply decapitates him, right? Fortunately, the younger twin, the one who retrieved his arm, right, is able to get his head back and put his elder brother back together again. So, they, they, again, they defeat death by surviving these, these uh, tests. Then the Lords of Death invite them to jump over a huge fire pit, right? Well, the twins can see right through this. They've, they've survived these six houses, right? So what they do is they, not only try, they don't jump over it, they jump directly into the pit and they're consumed in flames. And here's the younger twin, right? Here are the flames. And you can see in this case, he's got breasts, right? And a, and a woman's sash, right? But they leave behind instructions that their remains should be ground up and thrown into a Stygian stream. So it's a stream within the underworld. This is done and they become fish. In other words, they become souls of the dead represented by fish. This is a very common motif in Mimbre's bowls. And in, in these cases, I've put the elder twin on top. If you look closely, you can see that this is one, number one, it's not a mirror image. 
because they're head to tail, so they're not mirror images, right? This is the this is the elder larger twin because he's one, two, three, four, five chest spaces deep. The younger twin is one, two, three, four chest spaces deep. Also, they have leg-like projections. These are not fins, right? There's the anal fin, and they, they might have a dorsal fin, but these in fact are very much like legs, right? And in the Popo Vu, it's described that the people in the underworld saw them in this stream and their, their faces were seen and they looked like catfish. In fact, they were mermen or fishmen, but we'll see that, that transition taking place. Here's another one, again, with the larger twin above. And what do we have here? He's got arms, as does the younger twin below. Uh, Darwin, I'm sure, would have been delighted by this. Right? So again, we've got this duality. We've, we've got this idea, again, that's very much like the yin-yang and this transition that's taking place. Here's another one. This, this time he's got legs and arms, both, right? Then the twins emerge. They emerge from the bodies of the fish and they emerge from the Stygian stream. And if you look at the face, it's, he's really sublime. And you can see that the twin is pushing himself out of this fish body. And then here again, another one. And look right here, you can see catfish barbels on his chin, right? So again, this transition is taking place. We you can line these images up very much like a, a comic strip. But again, keep in mind that the art, the artists are changing, right? So the, the depictions are, are different from one to the next. Finally, they're almost completely emerged from the fish. And here, here we see an interesting image because you've got both the little sort of vestigial arms and legs but then very human arm, very human leg, and clearly catfish barbels or whiskers here. Here is, the, here is the elder twin and here is the younger twin, right? And to verify that you can see the right arm of the elder twin here is larger and the left arm of the younger twin. They're still attached to the catfish by what I've described as lifelines. Right, but they're now completely emerged. And at this point, they disguise themselves as kind of vagabond entertainers. Oops, how do I get back to that? Use the wheel. Okay, okay, okay. sorry. Now, here's another portrait. And this one is, is really interesting. Um, and I'll say right off the bat, for some reason, and I can't really explain it, for some reason, the younger twin appears to be taller than the elder twin. I have an idea why that is. But again, like their father in the, in, in the first slide, you can see they've already passed through the fish, fish stage. That's been done, right? Here's the elder twin, and you can see he's wearing the white sash tied in front as a male, and then his, his brother over here. You notice neither one of them has inner arms, right? And that's to emphasize this, which is the younger twin has brought back his, the elder brother's arm and it's reattached at the shoulder right here. So now they, they become vagabonds and they, the lords of the underworld or the death chiefs hear about these entertainers. So they're, they're disguised. They don't recognize them as the hero twins. They're disguised. They do a series of dances. They do an armadillo dance. They do a weasel dance. And they've done some other things to entertain other residents of the world. For one thing, they burned a house and then brought it back. They 
sacrificed a dog, cut off its head, its tail, its legs, and then brought it back to life, reassembled it. Oh, we've gone too far again. Can we go back one? Yeah. Use the field. There you go. Okay. Why does it keep jumping like that? Yeah, you're clicking too much. Okay, I need to go back. Okay, use the wheel on your mouse to click once. There you go. Okay. I'm not, I'm not touching it. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, try again. Okay. Okay. The other thing they do is that they, they, <laughs> they sacrifice each other. And this is a common theme that's found throughout the Americas, especially decapitation and then restoration by the twins. There are at least three memories bowls that show this scene. Um, and what you have here up above is the younger left-handed twin with what is described at Zuni as a turquoise rabbit stick. Again, he's holding it in his left hand. So the decapitation is associated with the left hand. He's cut off the head of his brother and the brother is identified again with the male sash, but the head is still attached by again, what I describe as a lifeline. It's, it's interesting that turquoise is mentioned here, because if you're familiar with the war and sun god of the Mexica, better known as the Aztecs, Huitzilopochtli was born with a turquoise dart thrower in his left hand with which he slew his sister and his enemy. So there's, a, there's a, not a direct connection, but there's a similarity here in terms of the sinistrality and the use of turquoise, right? So this, this is their, their final act. The, the lords of death are amazed by this. And so they say, do us, kill us and bring us back to life. And of course the twins are happy to oblige, right? but they do not bring the lords of death back to life. In other words, this is the final defeat of death. Now we see a really complicated one with a tremendous amount of information here. Here is the elder twin right here. And he's holding the head of a young deer, right? The deer is associated with the sun. And over here we see the younger, left-handed twin with the head of a rabbit, right? This is common again uh, throughout Mesoamerica and other parts of the Americas. And then here's their magic quiver, which is made out of an animal body, right? And then here's a headdress with the bird of doom and a fish in its gullet right here, right? So, and then below the, the elder twin, are the heads of two similar but not identical heads of pronghorns, right? Part of this is that deer and pronghorn both tend to produce twins, right? And so there's another duality represented here. So this to me is, is the twins almost in flight, right? As they begin to ascend into the heavens as we, Describe. So first, the father and the uncle of the twins descend as evening and morning star. Those are twins as well, right? There's a duality there, a twin duality there. And of course, the evening star precede, precedes the moon and the morning star precedes the sun. There it is again. All right, now here, here is the elder twin. And again, he becomes the son represented by a deer, right? Linda Sheely pointed out that if you, 
put aside the, the difference in size between a deer and a rabbit and forget about the antlers, these two animals have a lot in common. And this, this is a theme that we see somewhat referred to in uh, Pueblo uh, traditional stories as well. Both of these animals have timid behavior, pellet-like droppings. Right? They have long ears, short tails, and most important, a split upper lip. Right? It's interesting to note that people in uh, Texas, parts of New Mexico even, especially Mexico, uh, grandmothers will tell a pregnant uh, granddaughter not to be exposed to a full moon. And they'll, they'll often wear an amulet or something um, to protect them. The fear is that the child might be born with a cleft palate or hair lip. So that sort of um, tale is still out there. Then here's the younger twin. And again, He's got a burden basket, again, which is typically associated primarily with females. His burden, again, it's a metaphor, his burden is to carry the moon across the sky. And he's got rabbit ears, he's got a rabbit tail, and even his body is crescent shaped, right? So again, once they're in, in, in the heavens, once they're up above, then, at least in the Popo Vu, a, a fourth attempt is made to create human beings and they're made out of corn. And then the, the, the uh, fourth and fifth parts of the story actually go into the historic period right before the Spanish conquest, right? So that's, that's the uh, brief memories version. Now let's look at, here's another slightly clearer full moon again. We can see the head, here are the ears, here's the body and the tail. And farther afield, this is from the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming. Again, notice that the uh, rabbit is not in a natural position. It's lateralized to the left. It appears to be, if you want to be uh, species specific, it looks more like a jackrabbit than a, than a, um, a bunny, right? But again, uh, this sort of imagery, this lunar rabbit, is, is found in, in many places. Uh, there are at least a couple at uh, Three Rivers in New Mexico. There's one with a, uh, a crescent moon uh, in the Membres area in uh, McGee Canyon. It's a petroglyph as well. Now, we talked briefly about seven macaw. I was surprised to find this a few years ago. This is from a central Mexican codex. It's not Maya. There is a representation in the Madrid codex of what appears to be a macaw with the number seven and a human arm in its beak. Um, this is the original on the left. And this is a restoration in, in, um, in a copy of the codex. But this is, this is a clear representation of a macaw identified by the eyes here, right? There's the white beak, which is typical of a scarlet macaw. And this also is clearly a left human arm. This is from the post-classic period. And, um, but it's interesting to note that this is not a Maya representation, but it's certainly a referent to that motif of the arm of the elder twin being torn off by a monster. Now, here's, here's another one. I, I apologize for the glare here, but that's uh, original in the photograph. What we have here is the monster referred to as Seven Macaw. Here is his eye. Here's his nose. Here are his lips, right? Here is his left leg. He's so big that he's kind of stuffed into this bowl, right? Here's his right leg, and then here are his arms and hands down here, right? Here's the younger twin. He's on the back of the monster, very much like the image we saw in the Membrace version. His right hand here, he is blinding, and this is blood that's being shown here. He's blinding the monster, and then there's blood 
at his jaw here as well. So the point here is, although it's, he's named seven macaw, this is from a classic Maya, actually late classic Maya, 8600 to 900 uh, vessel. It's in a private collection in France. But clearly, this is not a bird of any type. It's a huge, monstrous being. We went too far. Okay. Now, if you look at this one on the right hand side. Here is the elder twin in, in the Popo Vu, known as one blowgunner or one, one hunter. Here's the blowgun right here. Okay. And here is a monstrous chimera, if you wish. It's got a sort of a bird like beak. This is, in fact, seven macaw. Right? And he's down here. He's about to be hit with a pellet. And then here's this weird bird, right, with its beak right at the point of what's going to be impact in the seven macaw. So this is why I refer to this bird both in Maya and uh, Membrace icon iconography as the bird of doom. When that bird appears, someone's going to die, right? So he is the bird of doom. This is, this is I don't know what sort of bird it, you know, um, is represented here, but the beak is very similar in this case to, to that of a cormorant. Now there are two, there are two scenes here. This is, this is a beautiful Maya vase. It's been, it's been uh, put back together. There's a line here that actually divides these two scenes. You remember we talked about the elder, um, or the uh, father of the twins head being hung in a tree. Well, here it is right here. Um, there's some discussion here whether or not these are calabashes which grow on the trunks of trees or more likely perhaps uh, chocolate pods, right? Could be either one of those. Here in this scene, uh, we see this mythical bird of doom. If you look closely, you can see it has the beak of a heron. It's got a pointed beak, right? But the legs are those of a different bird, right? Herons have long legs with, with almost a, a knee. So we, we've got another composite here. In the beak of this bird is a bone. Curiously enough, the word for heron in uh, Yucatec Maya is bak, B-A-A-K. The word for bone in Yucatec Maya is bak, and the word for prisoner. And he's in a, in a sort of subservient position to someone sitting on a throne here, right? So there's a play on words here, I believe, which is pretty typical of not only the iconography, but um, the Maya writing itself, bak, bak, bak. It's almost redundant, right? But again, the point of interest here is this mythical, this mythical bird. It is, uh, it is neither a heron nor a cormorant, it's a chimera. Here's an, <clears throat> another cylindrical vest, uh, a vessel. And here again, we see here's the beak of a cormorant, but the legs of a heron, right? This, <laughs> this scene reminds me of Hamlet. You remember, the, you remember the contemplation of the skull, Hamlet? is looking at the skull, alas, poor Yorick, Yorick, I knew him, Horatio. So here's this monstrous bird, and one of the legs is holding this skull, which has some sort of fish-like elements, right? But if you look closely, there's a face on the breast of this monstrous bird. There's the eye, there's the nose, and here's the mouth, right? This, is, this appears to be an old death god contemplating this skull within the watery underworld. So again, the bird of doom. Now in Arizona, we have a representation here. This is in the petrified forest uh, near Puerco Pueblo, where we have, uh, again, a bird with a really exaggerated beak impaling a human. So we're getting a little far afield here, but probably 
these are cognate or, or very, very similar motifs. Finally, we see uh, on a rollout of a uh, late classic Maya vase, we see a ball game in progress. And you can see it's a large ball, right? Latex, solid latex, very much like the one shown in the Membrace vessel. And we have one of the ball players over here, very elaborate, elaborate gear, all this padding and stuff. And he's wearing a deer headdress. And then on the right, we've, we've got a guy again with a lot of this gear and jaguar spots apparently. And on his head, very much like the Membrace bowl we saw with the elder twins headdress is the bird of doom with a uh, fish in its beak, symbolizing the, the souls of the dead. Okay, so that's it for the slides. Do we have some uh, questions? Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> I invite everybody to put questions in, and I will start with one that has been uh, several comments. Uh, Cynthia asks, have you presented your findings to Native peoples, and what are their thoughts? I have not presented them directly to, to um, Native peoples. I've, I've talked um, to a few people when I lived in Taos, and they were interested, but uh, they didn't comment in any great detail. <clears throat> okay, let me see. I had a couple in the chat here. And Jean, I saw your note there. If you could put your uh, question or comment in the chat, I'd appreciate it. Um, let me scroll up in the chat here. Hang on a minute, Mark. <clears throat> um, another comment yeah, about the Native American comments says, um, if you ask natives regarding these images, our interpretation may not be as, quote, sharply defined. Okay, Joyce says, by one twin being masculine and the other having feminine qualities, do they represent all of humanity? In a, in a sort of a mythical sense, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a, a basic duality. Uh, in our culture, we tend to dichotomize things. We say alive or dead, black or white, sun or moon. Uh, the duality would say alive and dead, male and female. So in a sense, they, they, they represent a path for humanity, I guess. Okay, here. Lynn Keller, the antlers that you said may be buffalo. I think they're prong, which look like these antlers with the base and the ends curl in, just like these. They're found in the southwest. What what kind of antlers? Uh, the one that you said were bison. No, uh, I I don't know what they are. I mean, they look sort of like bison, but what what does he think they are? Uh, Lynn, Lynn suggesting they might be pronghorn headgear. I I've thought about that. That's possible. Yes. It's, it's entirely possible. They're a little enigmatic, frankly. Okay, here's another one from Alexander. It says, are these twins somehow related to the dismembered corn god? In the, in the Maya iconography of the classic period, the corn god is thought to be the father of the twins. So there, there would be a relation in that case. Yes, yes. Okay. It's, it's not clear at all in the uh, written version of the, of the Popol Vuh. And again, um, it's, the, the pottery is not complete. There are motifs that are seen. One of these, um, there are a few that suggest that the father of the twins was in fact the, the corn god but that's, it's not described in that manner in, in the Popo Vu, the Hero Twin Saga of the Popo Vu. Okay. 
Okay, Marilyn asks, what do you make of the repeated appearance of decapitation? Well, it was, <laughs> it was a typical way to, to execute people. Um, again, we don't have very much evidence um, among the Pueblos that decapitation was, was common. Uh, it was very, very common uh, in Mesoamerica and especially among the Maya. As I mentioned, there are um, scores of vessels that show decapitation taking place on classic Maya vessels. And again, they seem to be associated with the left hand. So there's definitely a, a, a correlation there. In fact, it's about, it's almost an inverse proportion, about 90% of the decapitation scenes, um, it's done with the left hand, whereas you know, only 10% of the population is, is left-handed. So that's intentional. Hmm. Okay, Deborah asks, what first brought your attention that set you on this path of interpretation? <laughs> uh, when I was in graduate school at Calgary, my advisor, David Kelly, uh, suggested for a term paper that I take a look at Membrae's iconography. So I took a look, and the, the one that really startled me was the one, the one bowl that shows the, the, the younger twin on top of the bird-like figure and the human arm. When I saw that human arm, I decided that, that there might be enough material for a dissertation. And so I spent many years after that uh, gathering data. Uh, I'm working with three other, other individuals right now. Um, we're looking at the hero twins throughout the Americas. It is Pan-American. Uh, back in 1948 and 49, Paul Radin, um, looked at Winnebago, uh, a Winnebago version that is very similar to the ones I've just described here and made the statement that the, uh, the title of the first article was the basic myth of the North American Indians. Well, it's not just the North American, it's also the, the uh, Central American and South American. And he stated that the, the basic twins myth was found from Canada to Tierra del Fuego and from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And that's what we're documenting now. Could you elaborate on that a little bit as far as the, the antiquity of that interpretation? Uh, you and I had discussed, you know, that it's not necessarily representing migration and diffusion from one direction to another. Right, right. Um, one of the things that Raiden said in 1949 was <laughs> it would be ridiculous to assume that this myth diffused from one or two or three different points and then just spread all over the place. I think what we're looking at is deep structure. We can trace imagery of the hero twins back at least as early as the Olmecs. And in our view, it probably is much older than that. The Maya did not invent the hero twins. Right. Um, I would suggest that these ideas of twins and duality uh, may be as old as the Paleo Indian period. Uh, the problem with talking about diffusion is that people confuse what they call the arrival of the twins from one culture to the next with the appearance of the twins. They appear at different times within, uh, with different cultures. And I don't think it's a, a, a result of either migration or diffusion, right? These are long, long held beliefs. And the similarities, of course, are striking. But it's also the case that they are uh, ethnically distinct in some ways. For instance, in the Winnebago version, the second born twin is the more aggressive of the two. And, and the first born is, is more acquiescent. But I think we should expect that, right? Every group has their own uh, particular version, but there are at least 10 prominent motifs, including uh, decapitation and restoration that, that we find in at least 70 different groups in seven different major cultural areas, including South America. Both uh, graphic motifs, prehistoric graphic motifs, as well as ethnographically recorded. So <laughs> to sum up, it's really, really old. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, question from Carol. When the twins emerged from being fish, did they carry many fish characteristics and become stronger as men? No, I don't, I don't think they really um, kept anything from the fish. Th this again is an episode that's emblematic of surviving the, the tests and the trials uh, and the idea that fish represent souls of the dead. Um, they, they, they set a pattern for human beings um, that if you survive, again, through the watery underworld, become a fish, eventually you will ascend as did the hero twins in a kind of apotheosis and, and after your death and survival through the, through the watery underworld, you become one of the stars in the night sky. Okay, so that uh, leads right into another question from Paul. He says, the hero twins are mostly presented as the sun and moon. Do they also get presented as morning and evening stars? No, it's the father and the uncle. They are, the, the, uh, the father is represented as the evening star and the uncle is the, represents the morning star. And we know that Venus was viewed very differently in the Americas than it was, for instance, in the Mediterranean basin. It's associated with warfare and sacrifice. It tends to be the evening star is uh, related to warfare and the morning star uh, tends to be associated with human sacrifice. That's in the Americas you're talking about? The Americas, yeah. So it's not, it's not a female, right? Venus is not a female, right? And, and it's another twin. It's another duality. Okay, you're getting some compliments here in the chat. Uh, one from Roger says, I heard the hero twin stories a few times, but your presentation with this icon representation was far and away the best and most complete, providing a fuller understanding. Well, that's that's good to hear. Uh, and I would, I would suggest that people, um, if they're interested in this, look at... Uh, Ted Lux, 1985, um, Popo Vu, parts two and three, it's, it's very complex. I think I'm just scratching the surface here in terms of the, uh, what the iconography um, represents. But now I've turned my attention to this um, common cosmology and shared ideology throughout the Americas, right? It's not unique to either uh, Mesoamerica or, or the membranes in the Southwest, right? It's, it's, huh, it's embedded throughout the Americas. Okay, uh, Marilyn, who you probably remember from El Paso, Marilyn Guida says, thanks to Dr. Thompson for his recent book on the Hero Twins story. Could you comment on your recent book about that? Well, the, the, Im the images that I just showed you are from that book. It's available on uh, Amazon. And um, it, it pretty much just tells the story without the minute detail. I wrote it for a general audience and um, I wanted to concentrate on the imagery and not the pottery itself, right? That's why I didn't, I mean, in the past I've published a number of articles that shows the pots with kill holes and cracks and uh, you know, painting around the rims and all that sort of thing. Um, but I really wanted to concentrate on the images. They're, they're in their own right, they're beautifully executed. They're incredibly well done. Uh, some, I suppose, artistically better than others, um, but the imagery is, is striking. Um, and unfortunately in the past, a lot of people have looked at this, looked at this imagery and they've commented on scenes from everyday life. I don't see those. I, I think we're talking about allegorical, uh, comments and and metaphors um, that are that are quite complex, almost approaching a form of writing, right? Without the writing, but and again, when it when it occurred to me that they could be arranged in in a narrative sequence, um, that's when it really came together. So the the little book is for a, a general audience. I think um, even a even a ten year old could could read and understand it. Um, so oh, okay. the, mem the members twins and the rabbit in the moon. Okay. 
and it's and again it's uh, it's uh, available on uh, uh, Amazon. Okay, so same Thanks title for as your presentation tonight. <laughs> What's that? Same title as your presentation tonight. Though. Yes, yeah, that's okay. Again, I use the imagery from the book. Um, there are many, many, many others. Um, you know, there's a there's an interesting convenience that we use when we describe membrane pottery. We talk about figurative or representational um, images versus geometric. Um, I, I don't think the people who painted these were thinking along those lines. In fact, um, there are a lot of membrane bowls that we would regard as geometric, but their elements, such as a um, abstracted wing that I believe are pars pro toto. In other words, a single element is suggestive of a whole. So this, this division we've made between two um, styles of pottery is, is really uh, just, it's just a convenience. About 35% um, of the 10,000 membrane bowls are figurative, so-called, right? And of those, about 12% seem to relate to the hero twin saga, including the fish. So we're probably looking at about conservatively 400 or more uh, bowls. I could be missing a lot of it. Maybe some of this, some of the imagery may be too subtle for me to understand, right? I haven't even taken on the, the so-called geometric stuff other than to note that that division is somewhat arbitrary. Okay. Uh, just a comment in the chat from Jennifer says, there are twins in the intaglios found here along the Colorado River, lower Colorado. You've probably yeah. seen some of those. Yeah, there, there are also, um, um, there, there are a couple of rock art sites that appear to um, depict the twins as well. And again, it, it's based on the handedness and the and differential in size. So they're out there, they're definitely out there. The other thing that I noticed is that most of the Pueblos have what are called war chiefs. And these are almost like the living representatives of the hero twins. And the Pueblo groups call them the little war twins or the warrior twins, right? So these, these traditions have not disappeared. They're, they're still with us to some extent. Okay, here's kind of a line from Katja. She says, the similarities in motives on members' poles and the Mayan Popol Vuh and imagery is very striking with the motives being very close. However, there is not too much evidence of Mesoamerican rage goods. I'm not sure if that's the word you meant. Trade. In, in the members area, trade, trade goods maybe. Can one assume that the members were first to document an oral myth that existed before the Mugion region? before in the Mugion region? I, I think so, yeah. Um, I, I think, <laughs> I, I think for whatever reason, they, they were probably one of the first and it doesn't show up until about AD, the twins don't show up until about style three, AD uh, 1000. I think there was influence from the from Mesoamerica, probably having to do with the macaws that were being imported. Um, every time I look at that membrous vessel of the ball game, it suggests to me, and this is just purely speculation, that somebody in the membrous area saw a ball game. We don't have any evidence that the membrous actually played the ball game, although it would be easy to miss a simple ball court. Ball court. Um, no, I don't. I don't think it diffused. Um, through trade from Mesoamerica. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was probably some sort of contact with Mesoamerica with respect to the macaws, however, right? They're not native to the members area. Um, uh, Pat Gilman and uh, um, Christina Wyckoff and I published an article where we suggested that we, we thought the membranes probably went and got the macaws on the Gulf Coast. And some of that has been documented uh, certainly genetically they're related to the Gulf Coast, but they're so closely related, both those at, at Chaco Canyon and in the Mimbris, that the people who did the, uh, 
DNA studies have suggested that there was a breeding station somewhere between those two areas. Um, I'm not sure of what that means, frankly. I'm not an expert on the DNA, so I, I can't really comment on that. Um, but the point is they, they were imported and it's possible that some ideas um, may have been imported with the macaws, but I don't think it was the case that it diffused from the Maya area to the members. Okay, from the camp, please, please give a reference to Popol Vuh parts two and three. Uh, there, there is a modern translation of the Popol Vuh that you can find online, right? There are, there are four versions, good high quality versions. The first was published back in 1950. It's the Racinos version. Um, Racinos translated it directly from Mayan uh, to uh, Spanish, and then it was translated from Spanish to English. That was the first one. Then there, there was another one, kind of a, a poetic version by uh, Edmondson, what's his name, Monroe Edmondson. And then um, the one that I've used since 1985 is uh, by Dennis Tedlock. It's available in paperback now. And then there's been a fourth one by a fellow named Christensen. I think he's a, a Mormon. And um, I haven't really looked at that one very closely. I'm, I'm very happy with the Tedlock version. Um, and I think that's available online, is Tedlock. It may be, it may be, yeah, it may be. Um, yeah, you, earlier you referenced the parts of the Popol Vuh. Uh, how is it broken up exactly? Well, again, the, the first, there, there are five parts, at least in the Tedlock version, right? The first begins with the creation of, of the earth and animals, right? And then um, it goes, then this ne the second part is the um, adventures of the twins with respect to destroying monsters. And then it goes to the birth um, of, of the twins and the uh, death of the father and uncle. And then the fourth part, um, the, uh, there's a, a successful creation of human beings who honor their creators that they're made out of corn. And the in previous ones, they were made out of wood and clay and they didn't work, right? And then in the fifth section, it's, it's, kind, of, it, it's kind of historic, uh, talking about the kings and other people up to the Spanish conquest. Okay, a lot of compliments here in the chats. <laughs> One from Joy says, the Chinese moon lander was named, quote, Jade Rabbit, a reference to the moon rabbit. Yeah. Okay, Deborah says, as you noticed with Bach, 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 there are often visual puns found in art. Is there any way to discern this going on in membrous ceramics? Uh, no, not, not that I've been able to um, discern. Again, sometimes it almost seems like the reiteration with respect to the arms and things like that is, is redundant. Um, but thank goodness it's there so we can, we can see it and, and appreciate it. Mm. Um, certainly, the written uh, ancient Mayan is uh, confusing because often a word will be polyvalent. It can have uh, three or more uh, meanings uh, depending on context or in some cases, perhaps <laughs> we'll coin a word here, Trimultaneously, right? It might mean all of those things at the same time, right? And and I'm sure there's humor involved there as well. And and I would say that about the membrus as well. I, I think there are humorous elements. Uh, we, I don't recognize them, but I'm pretty sure they're there. Okay, comment from William says in the northern southwest there are occasional archaeological sites in direct association with twinned rocks including yeah. the twins in Bluff, Utah, the elephant feet near Tonalia, Arizona, and Chimney Rock in, in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's all I see in the chat or Q&A. If anybody else has questions or comments, please get them in now. And I would like to comment, Mark is broadcasting from Florida. So <laughs> it's, 
It's dark here. Eleven <laughs> twenty p.m. where he is. So I really appreciate him staying up late. He says he's a night owl. Yeah, I can believe it. <laughs> Well, um, thank, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to get it out there. And oh, one other comment I wanted to make, there's a note in Tedlock about um, Seven Macaw becoming a constellation. And it's interesting, uh, especially those who poo-poo the idea that the monster Seven Macaw could be represented as a bear. He suggests Ursa Major or the Big Dipper because there's seven stars involved there. And I, I think that that may be the case, right? Mm -hmm. That that when the, when these these major fig uh, figures die, they ascend into the sky, whether it's the father and uncle, whether it's the twins, right? And they be they become stars, or perhaps in in one one case at least a constellation. And the great bear is recognized all over the Americas. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're certainly getting a lot of complimentary comments in the chat here, and I will give you a copy of the chat file. Oh, that would be lovely. That yeah. would be very, very nice. And Mark, I'd like to thank you. I've been looking forward to this for a really long time. And for those of you in the audience who are still with us, I'd like to encourage you, if you're not already a member of Old Pueblo Archaeology Center, if you would consider either becoming a member or sending us a donation to help us pay for our Zoom subscription, which we just had to fork out the money for again annually <laughs> this week. And we also do a lot of children's education programs that we can use uh, funding for. So we would appreciate your support on that. So with that, I'd like to thank Mark again. Thank you all for attending and everybody have a good late night, especially Mark. Thank you all for your attention. I very much appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Adios. Take care, everybody.